me start by saying that I really enjoy driving, and I'll often be on the road for hours just listening to music and getting lost. So more often than not, I will sleep in my car on the side of the country road. I don't like it when I'm the passenger though, so I always go alone. Usually, I sleep for a bit, wake up, then go home without incident. There's been a couple of times when a deer has startled me or even a person knocking on my window to make sure I was okay was met with a scream. But what happened last night takes the absolute cake. I took my dogs up to a really nice walk I had read about online. It was about a five hour drive and I had planned to drive for about an hour at a time, explore for a bit, then keep going so the dogs didn't get restless or bored. I had taken plenty of food and water and was planning to be gone for about a day, which I was, and was going to a park in a popular parking spot the caravanners and the like tend to stay overnight. It was lovely and myself and the dogs had a really good time. We arrived at our sleeping destination and found that there wasn't any space to park. The bays weren't laid out so you just kind of had to use your common sense and find a spot where you weren't blocking anyone in. The parking area was free and could only contain about 10 cars or vans without it being too tight. I was a little annoyed but hey ho, it's a very rural area so I carried on for a little while and pulled into a lay-by to rest before I drove home. I let the dogs out to do their business and then went to sleep, thinking nothing of it. To describe where I had parked, it was opposite a little cottage but not directly in front of it, and there were plenty of trees so I didn't feel as though I was intruding on the owners in any way. I felt very safe. For some reason, I was having trouble nodding off. Usually I slept like a baby in my car because it is very spacious and comfortable, and as silly as it may sound to some, I genuinely thought I had nothing to worry about. That was until a long, high-pitched scratching sound woke me and the dogs up at about 11pm, just after I had drifted off. The dogs went nuts, as they usually do at the drop of a hat, and I was still in a confused daze when I saw a very tall, middle-aged man dragging what I thought was a key around the perimeter of my car. He walked very slowly and didn't take his eyes off of me the entire time. He also had a very malicious grin on his face. Horrified, I cranked my chair up and started the car, ready to floor it, but he had made his way to the front of my bonnet and trees were blocking me from reversing. This was when I saw that he was holding a butcher's knife. He held it up and sort of waved it at me. I screamed and laid on the horn, and my dogs had leapt over the back seat and were practically frothing at the mouth, and it didn't seem to faze him. This lasted about 10-15 to 15 seconds, not long, and then he just slowly walked away, across the road, and into the cottage. I drove home without stopping. I'm never, never doing that again. Thanks for ruining it for me, genuinely terrifying man, and thanks for ruining my paintwork. I don't know if he was trying to teach me a lesson for parking outside of his house or what, but either way, I will probably be scarred for life. One time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I haven't been to too many bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed that she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. This girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already pretty out of it. To be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get a free drink, so... I told her we didn't have much money. She offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He obviously went a little too far. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it, he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but 
I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him. He was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed that she thought that I was jealous or something, but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said we could go to her place alone. At this point, I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed, so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said smiling as she held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I felt a little uneasy. We got into her car. We drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it so you don't have to worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier with telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame, so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also, and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips, but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know that I was acting drunker than I was. She actually believed I was sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple of more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house. She closed her front door and then locked it. I thought that was strange, but assumed that she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom. I walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. I just felt strange. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and made myself puke up the liquor that I had drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk, but I still wanted to hook up with Candace, so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and I could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head. That strange, very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me. Let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized it was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her that I was sorry that I was so drunk. She said, It's fine. Just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again this time. I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. 
I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I have ever ran in my life. I didn't look behind myself for anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and ran toward the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a star CVS. I ran into the CVS and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called a taxi and went home. I try to think what happened that night. What was she, or they, planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? I live in the valley of Sacramento, California, a few miles from the American River. This particular river is only a short walk from a vintage part of my town, where there are absolutely nothing but chickens and family-owned businesses. My first job was a family-owned coffee shop when I was 16 in that little town, to give you some backstory. Now, a lot of homeless folk often flock to the river and would often wander in my shop. I dealt with the odd bodies on and off almost every day without care. However, there was one weirdo I remember vividly enough that it still makes me sit and wonder. When I was new to the shop, it took some time to get to know regulars and remember their names. I had a lot of faces to memorize. One face in particular, for some reason, sat in my mind far above others. A stout bald man with a wide nose and thinly rimmed glasses. He wasn't quite old, but he wasn't the youngest man I'd met. He would stand outside my store for about ten minutes every day before coming in to stand in the back of the cafe and watch me and my other co-workers clean and make coffee. Sometimes he wouldn't order anything, but when he did, he would always get a small black coffee and a small serving of potato salad. He would always ask for napkins and he would always ask for a pen. After ordering, he would proceed to write things down on one of the napkins, leave his empty coffee cup on the table and take his food out the door, where he would stand and watch us pick up his trash. I noticed over time that he seemed to look irritated when I wasn't the one to do so. Every time he did this, he would leave small notes in poor and rough handwriting. He would then throw away his salad outside. His notes were more personal. At first, I thought of it as nothing more than a sweet thank you. I often write small notes to servers on receipts from time to time, things like, wonderful day, thank you, it slowly became more queer over time. Beautiful day, take a break, I'm outside. You look lovely today, love your hair. My coworkers would make a gag out of the notes if they weren't thrown away before reading. Once, I assume, he figured out that the other girls were the ones grabbing them. He began to leave them on the end of the counter where my espresso machine was. You make me happy, Keen, one of them read. I still don't know how he learned my name or who he asked, but I presume one of my co-workers on the day I was off. I began to get increasingly uncomfortable whenever he would stand outside and watch me work, or when he would order from my till. I could only smile and thank him as I got his coffee and salad, customer service voice and all. This next part is where it gets interesting. One week toward the end of summer, he worked his routine of window shopping before ordering, asking for napkins and a pen and going about his letter. However, he did not ask for a pen or napkins and proceeded to only ask for coffee. He left to the restroom. I forgot how long he was in there since I myself took my lunch break as soon as the order was done. When I returned, I was told that someone had left their cup in the restroom and it had been emptied and left on top of the toilet. When I went in there and checked, it was filled with baby gravy, if you know what I mean. I honestly don't know if it was him, but the timing was too close to not assume. I did not see him after that for a while because I traded my early starts for closing shifts. The last time I had seen him, he came in late. I presume he found this out either by stalking or asking my coworkers why I was no longer a morning maid. He asked me kindly for a cup of coffee and a potato salad, a pen, and a napkin. 
I obliged, but I was hardly enthusiastic. The routine went normally. He drank his coffee, sat and wrote, left it on the counter without looking up and walked out into the night. He didn't stop to watch. He didn't throw away his salad. You're lovely every time. Thank you for the smiles. Leave the glitter to the blondes. I don't even know what that means. He also said, You're a young flower amongst the sunset. Keen. After that, I never saw him come into the store or lurk outside of the window. I don't often lend out pens as much as I used to. This story happened almost two years ago. It was summertime and I was about to turn 21. Even after the fact, I still looked as though I was underage. For reference, I am a female, fairly short and baby-faced. This particular summer, I worked at a truck stop combined with two fast food chains. I worked in one of the fast food areas. Something else to mention is that this truck stop was located right next to a very busy highway. This meant that we received an abundance of customers on a daily basis. Our fast food chain was employed only by women, particularly high school students as this area did not have many places to find work. Once I began working there, I immediately began to notice that one man stood out every time he came into our workplace. This man was in his 40s with black hair, a thin stick of a man, dressed in all black and wearing a fedora. No matter what, he always wore the fedora. As someone who had just started working there, I really made it a point to focus on making connections with the customers, making eye contact, introducing myself, lots of smiling, basically just trying to be the best employee that I could be. The first time this man came in, he was straight-faced and did not speak much. I took his order and when he left, my co-workers began to talk about how he was a weird guy. Fedora man would come into our workplace every single day and comment on my very underage co-workers' appearances, even go as far as to ask for their phone numbers. My co-workers have told him many times that they are not interested, underage, etc. This did nothing to deter him. I was immediately concerned but tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. My second encounter with Fedora Man was vastly different. This time Fedora Man seemed eager to see me. I recall so vividly how he watched me serve every single customer in line. Each time he got closer to ordering, his smile would grow wider and wider. Pictured a closed smile turned wide with all of his teeth showing each time he got closer to me. Once it was his turn, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, You're a lot nicer than all the other girls here. Not once did that creepy smile leave his face. I don't think I ever saw him blink. I thanked him and continued with his order. Fedora man thanked me and off he went. After about an hour or so of serving customers, I was asked by the manager to step into her office. Once inside, my manager gave me a heads up that Fedora Man called her gas station to personally let her know that I was a great addition to the team. Fedora Man also asked for my number. My manager hoped that by telling Fedora Man that I was underage, even though I wasn't and this didn't stop him from hitting on my other underage co-workers, that this would deter him from trying to get my number. His exact words per my manager were, I don't mind, a little jailbait. My manager let Fedora Man know that this was incredibly inappropriate. Fedora Man simply laughed and hung up the phone. As Fedora Man had tried asking for multiple girls their number, she managed to finally do something about it and notify our male supervisor. The next day, our supervisor approached Fedora Man as he walked into the store. They talked for a few moments before Fedora Man stomped out. He did not look happy. Later on, my manager would tell me that our supervisor did not ban Fedora Man from the store, but rather let him know that he was making us uncomfortable. This did not deter Fedora Man as he returned the next day and specifically asked for me. I was nervous, but still served him as it was my job. This time, Fedora Man asked for my number in person. If I wasn't working, I would have said... No, God no. But as I was on the clock, I politely declined. Fedora Man continued to smile and show all of his teeth. Fedora Man continued to return every single day and specifically asked for me. 
After a few days of this going on, I finally broke down and asked to work in the back of the store every time he came in so I could avoid seeing him. Fedora Man made me incredibly uncomfortable and I wanted to avoid seeing him as much as possible. The last time I ever saw Fedora Man was a week or two right before summer ended. After weeks of trying desperately to avoid Fedora Man, things finally came to a boil. On this day, I worked the early shift and therefore began to do the usual stuff. Turn on machines, prepping items, etc. My manager was the only one with me and she had stepped out for a few moments for a cigarette break. Usually, we don't get customers that early in the morning. My guard was down and since I was in the back of the store where no customers were allowed, I had some music playing. I was singing along to the music and prepping for the day when I saw a black mass start to the right of me. I turned off my music and asked if anyone was there. No answer. As I was already jittery from Fedora Man, I simply told myself that I was overreacting and turned on my music once more. After a few moments, I felt someone behind me. I turned, and who do you think it was? I let out a yelp in surprise, which only made Fedora Man laugh heartily. Fedora Man stated that he was hungry and wanted some food. I immediately began to scold him and remind him that this area was for workers only. At this point, my manager returns from her cigarette break and sees that Fedora Man is in the back of the store. She shouts at him to leave and states, She doesn't even like you! In the biggest voice she could muster. Fedora Man smiled his toothy smile and simply walked to the front of the store. I refused to serve him and let my manager know that he needed to be banned from the store. I wish I could say that this story had a happy ending, but it doesn't. I ended up leaving that job a week later and haven't gone back since. I occasionally talk to my old co-workers and they have let me know that Fedora Man still comes in every day, hitting on the underage girls there and asking when I'll be coming back to work. About 11 months ago, I started working in a big corporate retail store that specializes in tech, mostly high-end goods, part-time. I'm a female, 6 foot tall, in my late 20s, and a former NCAA water polo player. My job at said store was more behind the scenes. My primary duties were to answer calls and assist with orders, complaints, and scheduling via the phones. My secondary duties would be to assist the front lanes when lines got long. I am friendly, outgoing, and love to chat with customers. Some regulars I joke around with about various topics, but nothing unprofessional, nothing suggestive, and I never expressed interest in any customer. All of this happens in a two-month period. One day, a customer, older gentleman, mid to late 60s, 6'5 to 6'7, who has become a few-day regular, comes up to me while I'm at a register and is making a purchase while holding a coffee. Jokingly, I ask where my coffee was, and he proceeds to offer to get me a coffee. I decline his offer several times with, Oh no, I was joking, thank you though, and go about my day. Over the next couple of days, I am noticing this guy more and more, and am doing quite a few checkouts for him. There is small talk, as most customer service agents have with regulars, but he starts to mention highly personal details about me that I have never brought up in conversation. I don't discuss my personal life with customers unless it is relevant to the conversation at hand. These comments include my route to work, what kind of car I drive and the stickers that are on the back of my car, the college I went to, what apartment complex I live in, and what types of decorations I have outside my front door. In the first couple of times these tidbits are brought up, I brush them off as slip-ups or he must have overheard me saying something to someone, but then he starts asking for my phone number. I decline giving him my number, stating it's against policy, so he starts insisting I take his number and call him. Again, it is stated that this is against policy. I will add I specifically say, it is against corporate policy for me to take customers' information and I don't hand out my information out to customers. I'm sorry. As the days progress, he starts catching me as I come out from behind the register to run over to another department in our store for something. Again, I am neither a short nor small woman and I do not physically intimidate easily, but this guy who towers over me repeatedly places himself in front of me and demands I give him my number. This happened three or four times. 
Each time and day, he's getting closer to my personal space, demanding my phone number and information so he can call me. When there are times he doesn't get me as his checkout associate, he gets angry and irate, physically attempting to insert himself into my space to demand my information. And there are several times coworkers have to remove me physically from the situations because he is causing such a scene and getting so close to me they are worried for my safety. At this point, I am starting to get freaked out and I am feeling unsafe in my work environment, so I bring it up to a couple of my supervisors who just laugh it off and say I am being paranoid. My dad is getting calls from me almost daily telling him about my encounters and what this guy said or did, so finally he says I need to go talk to the police and see what they suggest I do since my supervisors aren't doing anything about it. I go and talk to the PD, explain the situation and end up in tears and shaking because it is finally hitting me that this guy is stalking and harassing me and I feel helpless. They fill out a report and tell me to take it to my supervisors to see if they can get pictures and information on this guy so the police department can contact him and issue a trespass, banning him from the property. I bring the case number to my supervisors who start to do some digging. I will repeat my primary job is behind the scenes in a cave and... I am rarely out at the registers during my shifts. They find that in a 30-day period I had processed over 17 transactions with this one customer and that he had been coming in 4-5 to five times a week, sometimes twice a day to buy $10 gift cards from our store. After taking pictures of his license plate and info from work, the police were able to find out that this guy lived over an hour and a half away from the store and he was driving almost 3 hours every day just to make a purchase. Then the security footage is looked at, and my supervisors notice they have no clear image of this guy. He knew where our store's security cameras were located and pointing and hid his face in actual height by hunching over from the cameras. They also noticed that there were points where he would be in the store for about 35 to 45 minutes at a time, just looking at the front registers, waiting for me to appear so he could make his purchase with me. If he didn't get me the first time, he would come back an hour or so later, right as I was about to get off of work because he knew the generics of my schedule. With no clear picture, the store had to wait on me to see this guy and point him out to the supervisor so they could issue the verbal trespass to him. He was able to come in and continue to harass me and threaten me for my information a few times because nobody really knew what he looked like, and by the time I had called for a supervisor he had left or they didn't know enough about the situation to trespass him. It took another two weeks before I was able to get a supervisor to trespass him from the store. He had cornered me again and had harassed me for my number and to check him out at the register, but I was able to slip away. When the supervisor approached him saying he was trespassed for harassing employees, he flat out denied that it was him and said that they were mistaken. When the police department called him telling him the boundaries of the trespass and asking for his side of the story... He told them I was just a girl that never told him no to a date, and that it's my fault for not telling him no. He insisted that he shouldn't be banned from the store because if I really didn't want him to bother me, I should have told him so. I saw him around my complex for a couple of weeks, and a few months later I quit retail because I didn't feel comfortable there. I loved working there, but I'd rather just never meet this guy again. I am a 24-year-old female that moved from Orlando, Florida to 18 miles outside of Valdosta, Georgia, middle of nowhere, to my family farm. Never had any issues in Orlando, but I got divorced and had to move in with my mom. It was my two small boys and I. We moved into one of the old farmhouses on my family's farm and it needed a lot of work. It was eight bedrooms and a mother-in-law suite. When we moved in, we only had two rooms cleaned up and worked on the rest of the house over the course of nine months. The man across the street, we will call Jay, was very helpful. From day one, he would come almost every day as he was feeding up his animals and helping with anything I needed. Over the course of nine months, I never had any issues and thought he was just a friendly middle-aged man. I never felt he had any ill intentions. The farmhouse was in a U-shape. The room I chose had windows in the courtyard area. This was the middle of the house. 
Jay had fenced in that area when I first moved in so I could let the boys play. The farmhouse was in the middle of the farm and set off the road so I never had any worries of being watched, mostly as my bedroom windows are in a fenced area in the middle of the house, so I didn't put curtains on my bedroom or bathroom. One day, my son was playing under the carport and Jay pulled up in his truck. He was going to look at my car for me. Jay didn't make it to the carport before my eldest son says to me, Hey, I seen him in my window last night. Later that night, I talked to my son and he told me he did see him out a window. I asked him if it was the kitchen window because you can see his horse pasture and he stops to feed them every morning and night. Chalking it up to that, I didn't think much else of it, but other things had happened. I guess you could say I wanted him to be the person I thought he was, so I overlooked a lot. My favorite candy somehow appeared in my fridge one day after school. My mom told me she remembered me telling Jay it was my favorite. Someone sent me flowers every Friday for a couple of months. I thought it was my ex-husband or possibly my boyfriend at the time. Neither man would admit to it. My boyfriend jokingly told me it was Jay. The next day, I came home from school and my mom had the boys playing under the carport and Jay was working on my car. My air suspension had a leak and Jay offered to look at it before I took it all the way to Tallahassee for the expensive repair. I got out of my mom's car and he asked if I wanted to see the leak he had found. As I bent over the hood, Jay stepped back. When I turned around, I commented jokingly on his 90s era cell phone. He had it in his hand. It's the type you don't see anymore, like a very early camera flip phone. Later that night, we came inside, and my mom told me she could swear that Jay had taken a picture of me on his phone. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't believe her. This man was seriously always friendly. Never any weird vibes from him. If I offered to pay him, it was always at cost, and that was rare as he would not accept my money. I should have known that people just aren't like that these days. I guess I was very naive. A couple of weeks later, I was mowing my courtyard. It was grown up pretty bad, and as I got close to my window, my heart literally sank into my butt. I had a newly placed center block outside both windows and my bathroom window. I can't tell you how, but I knew at that point that I had made a huge mistake and everyone was right about Jay. I called my friend and neighbor Josh to come look at the center blocks. He ran home and got a deer cam attaching it to a tree outside my window. This was at 3pm in the afternoon. That night I came home around 6 and was unloading the boys when I turned around. Jay was standing behind me. He said, Hey, didn't mean to scare you. I heard your mama was out of town. I said, Yes sir. I knew he knew because they are friends on Facebook. He told me to call him if I got scared or needed anything. I got the boys inside and we got snuggled into bed. They fell asleep in my bed when I realized that I had missed Sunday's episode of Game of Thrones. It was a good one. So I went to my mom's bed to watch. I was lying there talking to my ex-husband about the boys and the show when Josh called. I clicked over and he asked if my boyfriend was over. I told him no. This is about at 9.02 p.m., he told me a man is outside my window. The deer cam snapped the first picture at 9.02. My boys are in my room sleeping. Josh told me not to worry. He was already coming up the driveway and to meet him outside, on the other side of the house. Fear and dread literally drained through me. I slowly walked into my room and calmly scooped up my boys. I shut that door and sprinted through the house as fast as I could. We sat in Josh's truck until the police arrived. The deer cam snapped photos at 9.02, 9.22, and 9.30. He stood outside my window that long, waiting for me to come back. The police walked back into the field and could see where he was parking, but he was already gone. Behind the house is a massive produce field, and it was a tractor road for tractor access. I showed them the photos and ID Ed J. He was arrested at 2 a.m. that morning. And when they went through his phone, nine months of pictures. Pictures of me mowing. Pictures of me playing with my kids. Pictures of me in my bathroom, sleeping, bending over the hood of my car. He was watching me the entire time. I couldn't and didn't sleep for weeks. 
He ended up getting out of jail the following weekend and came into my mom's post office. She's a mail lady to tell her that he found my dead dog and he buried it for me. And even after that, only received five years probation and a restraining order. He still lives across the street. I stayed for maybe three months and moved on to Fort Walton Beach. A lot of people who know me will recognize this story. I often find myself telling it because of the absolute chaos of it all. I am a female living in New England. To add another detail, this took place in a decent neighborhood. We weren't white trash or anything, but here goes. Several years ago, the day before my 10th birthday, I was arriving home with my mother and little brother from a soccer game my brother had. We were arriving at our house when my brother noticed a yard sale next door. This house was run down. Apparently, some police activity went on before I was born, but that was over now, right? So a man walks up to us as we come over and he introduces himself. We'll call him Ray. Now, Ray was renting from the woman next door. Basically, this woman had a house with four rooms. One for her, one for her disabled son, and two for whoever paid money to live there for an amount of months. Ray seemed nice. He played a bit of soccer on the sidewalk with my brother and spoke nicely with my mother. He looked a bit trashy, but I didn't care. I just wanted to go inside my house and play Minecraft. So I left, not thinking much about the ordeal. That was October. In late January, a few months later, I was barely awake when my dad picked me up out of my bed and carried me to the master bedroom where my mom and brother were. The master bedroom is the farthest room away from the place where Ray was. I didn't like being disturbed, so I ran back to my bedroom. My dad yelled, saying there were police next door and I should go back in the other room. I did as I was told. I was so scared. Apparently, Ray's ex had gone over to the house to pick up some of her things. She brought her new boyfriend along. Ray started stabbing the boyfriend, and police were called, guns and all. I thought it was a one-time occurrence. I thought I'd be safe after that. March. My mom picked me up from school as usual. My brother was staying after school for guitar lessons. She'd get him later. I threw my backpack in the trunk and asked why there were so many suitcases in the back. She cheerfully explained that we were staying at a hotel. We drove around town and finally she said my dad will take me back home, that we wouldn't be staying at a hotel. I came home with my dad. I noticed that there was police tape around our lawn. My dad said that they had found drugs in Ray's house. That comment really didn't settle in till later. The full story was, Ray was doing PCP on his front steps. Someone noticed and called the police. Police came, half chased Ray into the next town over, half investigated the house. An officer picked up a package with drugs and immediately begins to have a bad reaction. Hazmat was called and they find a drug lab. Thinking it's a meth lab, the police advise my mom to evacuate, which she does. Turns out it wasn't a meth lab, so we could come back, but he was manufacturing PCP. My mom arrives home with my brother a few hours after I did, and that's when reality sets in. I had an anxiety attack, couldn't eat, and sat behind our couch using it as a makeshift bunker. I didn't sleep that night. A bit later, Ray, newly released from jail, does more illegal things, but the evidence room was tampered with so he couldn't be convicted. Meanwhile, my family has bought a new house, a large dog, security cameras, and plenty of weapons. My brother and I already attended therapy, but now our sessions happen more frequently. We were moving in two months. Meanwhile, Ray would watch us from his back porch, just sitting there. My dad confronted him once, and Ray started shouting death threats. The day we moved, Ray let his pit bull loose. It was in the evening, and he didn't know we had already left. He just knew it'd be around the time we would generally walk our dog. Finally, one month later, the big one hit. Ray strolled into a local food store high on PCP. He picked up a small child and tried to run. When the parents noticed, Ray dropped the child and tried to hide, but the police found him. He was fully released from jail a month later because the cells were too full, no transfers, nothing. It was like he was acquitted although I'm not sure what the outcome of the whole ordeal was. If he was capable of kidnapping, what would have been done to me? 
What about my brother? Ray, I hope you overdose on your stupid PCP. I gave you a chance and you gave me and my brother childhood trauma. So this happened about three years ago. I was 22 at the time and recently dumped, so my best friend and I went to our favorite bar almost every night. It was an Irish pub in downtown. It was really homey and chill and we made good friends with the bartenders. I want to mention that I'm a female and my best friend is a bisexual male. There is absolutely no romantic interest between us. My friend and I were two or three drinks in so we were feeling pretty good. And then this guy who looks to be in his 30s or 40s walks in and he has a very strong Irish accent. My friend and I are talking and I mention something about the new shirt I was wearing. I then hear coming from the other end of the bar. Yes, that is an absolutely stunning blouse on you. He looks to the bartender and says, Isn't she absolutely gorgeous with that blouse? Tell her. Tell her she's stunning. The bartender gives me a weird look and ignores him. He deals with creepy guys on the regular. About ten minutes pass and the creepy Irish guy comes over and sits down next to me. Usually I avoid talking to creepers at all costs and leave, but we were the only ones in the bar. My friend and I were just having so much fun laughing and giggling, and I knew nothing bad was going to happen inside the bar, so my friend and I made conversation with this guy. We were all laughing and I forgot what we were talking about, but he then goes, Yeah, I'm actually in the process of buying this bar. We thought it was so weird because we knew the bartenders and this was a family-run bar. I didn't think the owners were even thinking about selling it to some rando. I didn't question it though and we kept talking about his ideas for the bar and how he was going to expand it. He then gets up and says, Oh, wait for me for about 20 minutes. I'm going to go get my cousin from the hotel across the street. After he left, we forgot he was even coming back and we were just drinking and laughing like normal. When the guy does come back, he comes back with a super attractive woman. My friend had not been late in quite some time, so once he saw her, he was fixated on her. Even though she was older in her 40s, he was really into the older girls. I told him he could get it, then he would be a god. So, anyways, I went outside for a cig and the Irish guy follows me out, leaving my friend with the super hot lady. I was incredibly drunk at this point, not to the point where I couldn't walk, but all my safety precautions were out the door. The guy sits next to me and he asks if he could give me a palm reading. He grabs my hand and starts kissing it. Okay, weird. He says he comes from a long line of gypsies. So he's closing his eyes, rubbing my hand and kissing it and starts telling me some nonsensical fortune. It was vague and it had absolutely nothing to do with me. Anyway, we kept talking and he said that his cousins are looking for a fun night and thinks that we could show them around town, etc. I told him that my friend and I were pretty out of it and we were thinking about going home soon. He then says, Oh, it looks like your friend isn't going anywhere. I look in the window and I saw his hot cousin rubbing her foot all up and down my friend's leg. My friend, who isn't entirely ugly but doesn't usually ever get a chance with a woman like her, I could tell he was red in the face and was acting bashful. I started to think, wow, he is going to get it after all. But then I got a feeling that didn't sit well with me, even in my drunk state. I went back inside and sat next to my friend and asked how everything was. This is where my memory starts to get fuzzy. So there are circumstances that I don't remember leading up to how it got a little crazy. All I remember is this guy starting to speak louder and more aggressively towards everyone once I mentioned that maybe we should go home. The guy started giving my friend and I more shots, and he was demanding the bartender give it to him for free because he was going to be the new owner of the bar. Bartender says he didn't hear about this, so no free drinks for him. This made the guy so angry, he started throwing stuff over the counter. I then screamed that I didn't need to drink anymore. I was already too out of it. Guy gets in my face telling me I'm going to drink what he gives me. Literally shoved it in my face, and I actually did drink it. Guy demands more drinks. Bartender says no, and the guy says, Fine, here's twenty dollars. 
and throw a $20 bill at him. Then all of a sudden, something clicks in my friend's drunk, horny brain and he just realizes that we could be in danger. While the hot chick, the Irish guy, and the bartender all distracted and screaming, my friend grabs my arm and we bolt out of the bar. We ran all the way to my apartment, locked the door. We were like, wait, what literally just happened? We were scared to go back to the bar in case he actually did own it. Two weeks later, we decided to check it out. We see the owner and ask him if he's selling the bar to the crazy Irish guy. He then goes, wait, you were here for that? Yeah, that guy was a con artist. He stayed at the hotel across the street and was demanding a free room because he found drugs in the room and his kids could have gotten the drugs. This guy didn't even have kids with him. We never heard of this strange man and his cousin never again. I have a few theories as to why they were trying to manipulate my friend and I into coming with him. My first guess was robbery, but I've thought of everything to murder. Also, I looked up Irish gypsies and there is a whole thing about them traveling and stealing stuff. If anyone has a story like this or knows about what kind of stuff goes on with this group of people, let me know, because this event has bothered me for quite some time. As someone who has grown up on an infamous haunted plantation, I have never actually been scared of ghosts. Curious and intrigued, yes, but never scared. In fact, I have gone through a lot of trouble just to go to a haunted house or location. I live in Virginia, so there are a lot of places to check out. There has only been one incident that has scared me so bad I'll never ghost hunt again, and it wasn't even anything paranormal. When this particular incident happened, I was about 19 years old. My boyfriend at the time and I were very explorative, and we made it into a thing to go out at around midnight and go ghost hunting at random places. He lived in Williamsburg, Virginia, so there were lots of places to go. We would go around the Newport area as well. Some famous places that we visited often were Old House Woods, Crawford Road, Roswell House, etc., one night, we decided we were bored and wanted to get our group of friends together to do some ghost hunting. We got three of our friends on board and got ready to head out for the night. Usually, we would smoke on the ride, and when we were nice and toasted, we would go to our destination. On this night, we decided to check out Roswell, and then on our way back home, we were going to take a detour through Crawford Road. The night started out really fun. We basically couldn't stop laughing the entire night. One of my friends, on the other hand, couldn't shake this bad feeling he was having. He insisted that we go home or go get some food at a fast food place. He was also insisting that we skip Crawford Road because it was too out of the way from their apartment complex. Me and my boyfriend were very insistent that we checked out Crawford Road, and since my boyfriend was driving, my friend didn't get a say in the matter. We jumped back in the car, got some McDonald's, and headed to Crawford. Crawford Bridge is just this little bridge on a very desolated, creepy road. If I remember correctly, the road was about 10 miles long. The bridge was where they would go to hang slaves, so that area had a common report of ghost sightings. When we got on Crawford Road, we decided that when we got to the bridge, we would get out to get a better look and take pictures. Need I remind you that this is at about 1.30 a.m.? My boyfriend and I were not scared, but I guess the idea of that scared the crap out of my friend who was already freaking out previously. At the time, I thought my friend being scared all of a sudden was extremely strange, because he usually loved doing this stuff. He kept on just saying he had a bad feeling. He had a bad feeling, and he always trusts his gut. We should have listened, but we were stubborn, and we were almost to the bridge. Right as we came around the corner to see the bridge, we saw a car just parked on the side of the road. As we got a little closer to the car, the car came on and so did the lights. We assumed that it was some teenagers checking out the landmark like we were, but as we were passing them, I saw the outline of two older men, and I did see that they were both bald. It sent chills down my spine, so I told my boyfriend to keep driving and he agreed that we shouldn't stop or get out. We passed slowly, but when we were about to turn the corner for the bridge to be out of view, I saw that car slowly turn around, turn on his high beams and start following us. At first we were a little freaked out, but you know, coincidences happen. 
About two miles down the road, this car was right on our tail. We decided to go faster than normal to lose him. The speed limit on this road was between 30 to 40 miles per hour. We were going 65 to try to shake this car. The whole time, the car was so close to ours it was almost touching. At this point, we are all officially freaked out. My friend, who was originally freaked out, was now in tears. We officially were being chased down by these guys. I felt a lot of relief when I saw that there was a turn onto a highway up ahead. There were almost no cars on the road, so we didn't even stop at the stop sign. We ran right through and so did the car behind us. We saw a 7-Eleven up ahead, and we thought that if we turned into it, they would just keep going and leave us alone. But no, they followed us right into the 7-Eleven parking lot. We would be the only ones in the parking lot together, and at that time, I don't think any of us wanted to come face to face with the mysterious bald men. My boyfriend unexpectedly punched it out of the parking lot, followed by the mysterious car. At this point, we honestly thought we were all going to die. We had no idea what the intentions were of these people, but we knew that it obviously wasn't good, and we had been specifically targeted. Once we got on the road, we were flying. I mean, we hit 100 miles per hour easy. We were all screaming, and I managed to call the police, but... I was in hysterics going 100 miles per hour in an area that I wasn't as familiar with, with a car chasing us. At some point, the car got from behind us and got into the other lane. This was a two-lane highway and there was no passing allowed on this road. I looked over, thought I saw a flash of something metallic come up to their window, possibly a gun, and then all of a sudden my boyfriend slams on his brakes. The other car keeps going 100 miles per hour as we quickly try to turn around. When I look back, I see them stopping and also trying to turn around. By the time they turn around, we were already flying in the other direction. Somehow, I'm not sure how, but we lost them. We tried to find the most populated area we could. Once we found a random apartment complex, we stopped the car and we all started crying. My friend who told us we shouldn't go was yelling at us. He was going on about how we needed to be more careful and start trusting our instincts. Let me tell you, I have never not trusted his gut feeling again. Things could have gone a lot worse that night and I'm very thankful it didn't. Later that month I had learned that the area was known for gang activity. Unfortunately I learned the hard way that anything could happen at any time. I was very stupid and stubborn back then. All those times we went ghost hunting... Not once did I think that there could be a murderer there waiting for a group of kids, stupid enough like us, to come by. I was, and still am, an extremely shy person. I'm the person with the headphones in, hoodie up, ignoring most people. The girl with the stutter and shy mumbling apologies... I don't speak out or draw attention to myself, but that tends to attract the strangest people and the scariest guys. I had a huge crush on one of the really hot cool guys in school, sweet talker and a nerd. I hung out a lot with him and he introduced me to his group of friends. That's when I met him, tall perv. He was the strangest guy in the group. I mean, they were all pretty weird, but he stood out. He was very tall, had a flash drive around his neck 24-7, and he was very touchy-feely with his hands, nickname Tall Perv. I just met Tall Perv and he was already acting strange around me. The bell rang for us to go ahead back to class after lunch, but Tall Perv had other ideas. He decided to pick me up by my breast and had me standing up. I don't speak a lot, but I shrieked. He dropped me and said that it's okay because I'm cute. Don't worry, I, I didn't mean anything, but... It could, if you wanted it to. I ran back inside, terrified and confused. My crush pushed him away and was yelling at him. Neither one of them came after me. I still hung out with the crush again, but he was still hanging out with Tall Perv and his short friend on another day. So I went up and tried to talk with my crush. I was overhearing Tall Perv talk about terrible things in public. He bragged about his flash drive and how it was full of inappropriate images and videos. He also wore a flash drive. Crush looked annoyed, but jumped at the chance of being with me. 
Many months later, I was heading to a class that was in a different building when suddenly I felt a hand on my bottom. It was tall perv, laughing like it was a game. I had a textbook in my hand and started hitting him with it as hard as I could, yelling and screaming at him. His face fell and he took off. I thought I finally got rid of him. I did, and then he graduated. He never touched me again, but it doesn't end, sadly. He found me on Facebook years later. At this time, I forgot his name and face. He didn't have a pic of him in his profile, so I added him like, Huh, someone from high school, cool. After I broke up with my boyfriend, not crush, but someone else, guess who popped up on my phone? Tall perv, same day. He began texting me every day, saying how he missed me and wanted to hang out. I got onto Facebook and saw that 90% of my terrible memes he had liked and commented. I posted a ton of memes daily and he liked almost all of them. All my notifications were from him, messages and likes. I looked at the profile and I recognized him. It was Tall Perv. He was begging to hang out. And one day out of the blue he started sending me nude pics. I was shocked and kind of scared, so I decided to block him on Facebook. The end? Nope. I get a text message from my cell phone. Very, very few people from high school had my cell phone number. Hey, it's me, Tall Perf. You want to hang out? Come on, I miss you. We can come bake and cook at my house. I know you like sweets. We can make a cake. I know you live in this certain part of town and it's not that far. He was correct, but how did he know where I lived? Please, let's hang out. I can buy you lunch. I ignored his messages until he started calling me. He was crying and saying how lonely he was. He wanted me to go to his house and comfort him. He spammed his address at me. I finally blocked him on my phone. One year later, I get another message from him on a different number. Block that one too. He was a perv and definitely still is. But... He went to a whole other level with the stalking and begging. Remember, this went on for years. A close friend of mine recently warned everyone on his Facebook page about Tall Perv because he picked up a scared female friend from Tall Perv's house. He had apparently lured a girl to his house and attempted to assault her. She fled before he could grab her. She has not filed any charges that I know of. And if I ever see that guy again, it better be a mugshot. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And I guess this is posted on Christmas Eve, so... Merry Christmas. And I'll see you again soon.